Hey everyone, I'm Mohammed Hamama, and welcome to your ASCP preparation camp. Today, we're diving into the basics of carbohydrates, an essential topic you need to master. Whether you're prepping for your exam or just brushing up on biochemistry, you're in the right place. If you find this video helpful, don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe to stay updated, and share it with friends who are also studying. And by the way, our ASCP short notes are now available in easy-to-digest chapters, so check them out in the link below. Let's go! Carbohydrates are essential molecules, widely distributed in both plants and animals, playing vital roles in biological processes. They serve as structural components of DNA and RNA, and most notably, they are key sources of energy for living organisms. When we consume carbohydrates, they break down into glucose, a crucial energy source. The role of glucose in energy production Glucose is one of the most critical outcomes of carbohydrate metabolism. It's primarily derived from the breakdown of carbohydrates we consume or from our body stores. Under diverse conditions, hormones like insulin, glucagon, and epinephrine regulate blood glucose levels, keeping them within a narrow, healthy range. Interestingly, the measurement of blood glucose is one of the most common health tests, and high glucose levels often signal a disorder known as diabetes mellitus, a condition that impacts over 415 million adults worldwide. The chemistry of carbohydrates at the molecular level, carbohydrates are aldehyde or ketone derivatives of polyhydroxy alcohols. Despite the name, carbohydrates, these compounds are not hydrates in the typical chemical sense. Monosaccharides Monosaccharides are the simplest forms of carbohydrates, consisting of a single polyhydroxy aldehyde or ketone unit. These sugars can't be hydrolyzed into simpler forms. Depending on the number of carbon atoms, they can be classified as trioses, three carbons, tetroses, four carbons, pentoses, five carbons, hexoses, six carbons, or heptoses, seven carbons. For example, aldehydes have the carbonyl group at the end of the chain, while ketones have it in other positions, as seen in molecules like glyceraldehyde and dihydroxyacetone. Glucose and its structural properties Glucose can exist as either an aldehyde or enol, with the enol form favored in alkaline solutions. Glucose is an active reducing substance, readily oxidized by mild agents. The compound often forms ring structures, depicted using the Hayworth formula. These ring structures can either have hydroxyl groups positioned below the plane, alpha configuration, or above the plane, beta configuration. Disaccharides, the double sugars when two monosaccharides join through an oglycosidic bond, a disaccharide is formed. The bond forms between the aldehyde or ketone group of one monosaccharide and the alcohol group of another. Common disaccharides include maltose, two glucose molecules, lactose, a combination of glucose and galactose, sucrose, a mix of glucose and fructose. Maltose and lactose are reducing sugars, meaning they have a free aldehyde or ketone group, while sucrose is a non reducing sugar. Polysaccharides, the complex carbohydrates polysaccharides are chains of monosaccharides, providing significant storage and structural support in both plants and animals. Some common examples include Starch, a storage carbohydrate in plants, consisting of glucose units. Glycogen, the animal equivalent of starch, providing energy when needed. Cellulose, an unbranched polymer found in plant cell walls, crucial for structure but indigestible by humans. Chitin, found in the exoskeleton of arthropods, providing strength and protection. Glycoproteins, carbohydrates and proteins Glycoproteins are proteins with carbohydrate chains attached, and they play numerous biological roles. These proteins can help with cell-cell recognition, target proteins for secretion, and regulate the lifespan of proteins in circulation. There are two main types of glycoproteins. Oglycoproteins, oligosaccharides attached to oxygen in serine or threonine residues. N-glycoproteins, oligosaccharides attached to nitrogen in asparagine residues. 
Defects in glycosylation can lead to severe conditions, including forms of congenital muscular dystrophy. Digestion and absorption of carbohydrates. The metabolism of carbohydrates begins in the mouth. Here, salivary amylase partially breaks down carbohydrates into intermediate dextrins and maltose. As the carbohydrates move into the small intestine, pancreatic amylase takes over, breaking them down into oligosaccharides, primarily maltose. Disaccharidases, enzymes like maltase, lactase, and sucrase, then break down disaccharides into monosaccharides, glucose, the lactose, and fructose. These monosaccharides are absorbed across the intestinal wall via an active, energy-dependent process. Notably, glucose and galactose are absorbed more rapidly than fructose. Intermediary metabolism of carbohydrates. Once absorbed, hexoses like glucose enter intermediary metabolism. Here, they can either be converted into energy, stored as glycogen in the liver and muscles, converted into ketone bodies, amino acids, or proteins. Additionally, excess glucose can be converted to triglycerides and stored in adipose tissue. Regulation of blood glucose levels. The body regulates blood glucose concentration through multiple pathways, controlled by hormones. Key processes involved include Glycogenesis, the conversion of glucose to glycogen. Glycogenolysis, the breakdown of glycogen into glucose. Gluconeogenesis, the creation of glucose from non-carbohydrate sources. Glycolysis also plays a major role, converting glucose to pyruvate, which is further oxidized to carbon dioxide and water in the Krebs cycle and mitochondrial electron transport chain, generating energy. Additionally, the hexose monophosphate shunt produces NADPH from glucose. Hormonal regulation of blood glucose. Hormones like insulin, glucagon, and epinephrine tightly regulate blood glucose levels. Insulin lowers blood glucose by stimulating glucose uptake and glycogen synthesis, while glucagon and epinephrine work to increase blood glucose by promoting glycogen breakdown. Understanding hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia refers to an abnormally low concentration of blood glucose, generally defined as below 50 to 60 mg per deciliter. Hypoglycemia can occur after meals or during fasting, and symptoms vary widely. Common symptoms include trembling, sweating, nausea, and lightheadedness. More severe cases can result in confusion, seizures, and even loss of consciousness. Hypoglycemia and brain function. The brain is highly dependent on glucose, using approximately 50% of the body's glucose at any given time. When blood glucose falls below critical levels, around 20 to 30 mg per deciliter, the brain begins to experience dysfunction, leading to symptoms like headaches, blurred vision, dizziness, or worse, seizures and unconsciousness. Neonatal blood glucose concentrations. Newborns naturally have lower blood glucose concentrations than adults, with an average level below 35 mg per deciliter, 2.0 millimoles per liter. After birth, as liver glycogen stores deplete, glucose levels typically drop further. This can be particularly concerning in certain newborns. Causes of hypoglycemia in neonates Hypoglycemia in newborns is more common in certain conditions. Prematurity. Premature infants are more susceptible to hypoglycemia due to immature metabolic processes. Maternal diabetes. Infants born to diabetic mothers are at higher risk of low blood sugar after birth. Gestational diabetes mellitus, GDM, and maternal eclampsia are also associated with neonatal hypoglycemia. Transient hypoglycemia in neonates. The good news is that hypoglycemia in neonates due to prematurity, maternal diabetes, GDM, or eclampsia is usually temporary. In most cases, this type of hypoglycemia resolves on its own without requiring medical intervention. Hypoglycemia in early infancy When hypoglycemia occurs in early infancy, it tends to be more persistent than in newborns. This can result from Inborn errors of metabolism or 
ketotic hypoglycemia, which may be triggered by fasting or illness. In such cases, early diagnosis and management are crucial to avoid complications. Fasting hypoglycemia in adults Fasting hypoglycemia in adults is typically caused by a decreased rate of hepatic glucose production or an increased rate of glucose use. With more than 100 possible causes, fasting hypoglycemia requires careful evaluation. Common triggers include Drugs, such as pentamidine, quinine, and sulfonylureas. Ethanol, which inhibits gluconeogenesis, especially in malnourished individuals. Hepatic failure, leading to impaired gluconeogenesis or glycogen storage. Hormonal deficiencies, including a lack of growth hormone, glucocorticoids, thyroid hormone, or glucagon. Insulin-producing pancreatic tumors and Non-pancreatic neoplasms, which overconsume glucose. Septicemia, where glycogen stores are depleted and glucose use increases. Symptoms of fasting hypoglycemia. Fasting hypoglycemia often presents when blood glucose drops below 55 mg per deciliter, 3.1 millimoles per liter. Symptoms typically worsen as glucose levels approach 50 mg per deciliter, 2.8 millimoles per liter. Common symptoms include trembling, sweating, nausea, rapid pulse, lightheadedness, hunger, epigastric discomfort. Diagnostic approach to fasting hypoglycemia. To diagnose fasting hypoglycemia, a key indicator is the combination of low plasma glucose and abnormally high insulin levels. Diagnostic criteria include Plasma insulin levels of at least 18 picomoles per liter Plasma C-peptide levels greater than or equal to 0.2 nanomole per liter Proinsulin levels greater than or equal to 5.0 picomoles per liter when fasting plasma glucose is below 55 mg per deciliter, 3.1 millimoles per liter In most cases, provocative tests like glucagon or talbutamide are unnecessary. More advanced tests, such as intraarterial calcium stimulation with hepatic vein sampling, can help localize an insulin producing tumor, insulinoma. Additionally, some patients may spontaneously develop antibodies to insulin, which can be identified through high titer serum insulin antibody tests. Postprandial hypoglycemia, also known as reactive hypoglycemia or idiopathic postprandial syndrome, refers to the experience of hypoglycemic symptoms after eating, even when blood sugar levels are not critically low. This condition is often misunderstood and misdiagnosed. Causes of postprandial hypoglycemia Several factors can contribute to the development of postprandial hypoglycemia. Antibodies, to insulin or the insulin receptor can interfere with normal glucose regulation. In born errors of metabolism, such as fructose 1,6-diphosphatase deficiency. Other conditions, including diabetes mellitus, gastrointestinal dysfunction, and hormonal deficiencies, can also cause symptoms of hypoglycemia after meals. Symptoms of postprandial hypoglycemia People experiencing postprandial hypoglycemia often report autonomic symptoms 1 to 3 hours after eating, which are typically relieved by food intake. These symptoms include numbness or tingling, sweating, palpitations, anxiety, fatigue. Diagnosing postprandial hypoglycemia. To confirm a diagnosis of postprandial hypoglycemia, it is essential to demonstrate hypoglycemia during a symptomatic episode. Two key diagnostic tests are 5 hour meal tolerance test or a hyperglycidic high glucose, breakfast test. However, the 5-hour glucose tolerance test is not recommended due to its potential for false positives and unreliability. Hypoglycemia in diabetes mellitus Postprandial hypoglycemia is also relevant in the context of diabetes. Here are some key points. Frequency, 
hypoglycemia is common in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes, with insulin users experiencing 1 to 2 episodes per week. Severe hypoglycemia affects 10% of insulin users annually, and up to 2 to 4% of people with type 1 diabetes die from severe hypoglycemia. Impact of insulin therapy, intensive insulin therapy, while improving blood glucose control, also increases the risk of hypoglycemia. Mechanisms, in type 1 diabetes, defective glucose counterregulation and hypoglycemia unawareness play major roles in the frequency and severity of these episodes. Long-term consequences of hypoglycemia. Severe hypoglycemia can lead to long-term complications, such as cognitive decline and increased risk of dementia, cardiovascular disease and even death in extreme cases. Patients with hypoglycemia unawareness face a heightened risk of severe episodes, making it crucial to monitor and manage their condition effectively. That wraps up our breakdown of carbohydrates. I hope this helped clarify some key concepts for your ASCP prep. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications so you never miss a new video. Share this with anyone who could use a little extra support in their studies. And if you have any questions, drop them in the comments below, I'd love to hear from you. Also, don't forget to check out our ASCP short notes in the store to boost your preparation. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Keep learning, and good luck.